and uh, is doing a master's degree over there. Uh, and he is the biodiversity coordinator at the CSUN uh, Institute for Sustainability. A really, really, um, I, gotta check. I had to check off that I consented to be recording. Anyway, um, so without any further ado, uh, welcome Richard and I'll let you uh, introduce yourself further and introduce, I see there's a number of your um, team members that are here. If you wanna give them credit, that'd be awesome. And we're looking forward to hearing from you. Yeah, thank you so much, David. It means a lot. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. And I want to first and foremost thank Victoria for inviting me. Um, Victoria volunteered at our new fruit orchard that we have at the Cal State Northridge campus. And I would like to report, and I've told Victoria this, the plants that um, they planted are gigantic now, um, even in the few months that they've been in the ground. Um, the coastal sage scrub plants that we planted are doing great. And uh, it's volunteers like Victoria and other people that you know help uh, make the food garden that we're trying to promote and you know give fruits and vegetables to students in need and to food pantries yeah. that makes it all much better. So thank you. So let me and I would also like to thank my supervisors, uh, Dr. Um, Nat Zapia and Sarah Johnson. Um, I think they're both here, or at least I saw Sarah here. So uh, thank you. And oh, another volunteer, I believe Karen is here. Um, Karen helps out a lot in the food garden and like with weeding and stuff. So really appreciate it. Let me share my screen. This is just going to be a little bit awkward. So um, okay, that wasn't that bad. So first and foremost, I just want to ask all of you, so whose land are you on? Right? Um, most of us are settlers in Los Angeles, in the Los Angeles Basin. It's important to acknowledge that. For me, myself, I'm on Tatambium land, and a lot of my research is going to be on Chumash land. And I would like to acknowledge that this is stolen land from the Tatambium nation and from the Chumash nations. And this is stolen knowledge, where a lot of this has already been previously known for hundreds of thousands of years. So part of, I think, as settlers, what we need to be doing is giving positions of powers to indigenous folk um, in Los Angeles and also paying your rent when possible. Um, for me, the, um, I could do that through um, one, one way, right? Is you can support like cultural organizations and scholarships that help indigenous folk. There's a ton of different ways and businesses that you can support. Um, that's for you to do your own research, figure out whose land you're on and support the people that you can in that way. All right, so my presentation today is gonna to be Are Oaks in the Santa Monica Mountains in Trouble? And this is my master's thesis. And so it's gonna, I'll be talking a little bit about my remote sensing and ground truthing of Quercus agrifolia and Quercus lobata. Again, my name is Richard Rockman. I'm a graduate student at California State University, Northridge. I'm a plant ecologist specializing in native and invasive plant species, and the biodiversity coordinator for the CSUN Institute for Sustainability. If you can keep your questions towards the end, um, that would be great. Even in the chat, it kind of gets a little distracting for me. So um, I know it's like the urge is a lot. So just kind of try to save your questions and we can, we can talk about it at the end. All right, so let's investigate. Are oaks in trouble in the Santa Monica Mountains, right? So uh, here we have a, a oak woodland that's being restored in the Santa Monica Mountains. It's called Potrero Creek near the Wendy Trailhead. And this was started in the 1990s after a really bad wildfire, Kraft Mac and Cheese, the Kraft company, they donated millions of dollars to kickstart this restoration project. And it's led to things like that mule deer that are right under that oak tree. So thank you Kraft Mac and Cheese for this restoration project. So we're gonna put on our Sherlock Holmes hats on our little acorns and we're gonna to try to figure out are oaks in trouble, right? We're gonna get the who of what we're talking about. It's oaks, a little spoiler alert. Uh, where we're talking about, what, what, what's going on? What's all the hubbub? How do we investigate this, right? And then why? why, why, why should we care about oak trees? I mean, I think that's obvious to most of the members of California Native Plant Society, uh, but we'll, we'll dive into that. Okay, so this is a report called the Red List Oaks um, 2020 that recently came out. It was, it was really intense. 
So this report went into different uh, oak species across the entire world, a lot that are threatened, different issues that are facing oaks. And as you can see, oak diversity is very wide uh, across the globe mostly in the Northern Hemisphere, but the highest amounts of endicism for oaks is gonna be in Mexico and China. And they even dip down into Malaysia as well, Indonesia. So oaks are really widespread and diverse. California is a huge source of diversity, but so that's where most of this talks gonna be focusing today. But I, I thought this report was really fascinating and I implore you all to look it up and read about it. But so these are the various conservation issues that are facing oaks across the world. And a, a lot of them are in really big trouble, right? And so the issues that we're mostly gonna be facing with the two dominant species of oaks in the Santa Monica Mountains that we'll be talking about is this invasive and other problematic species, genes and diseases. And we'll touch upon a little bit of all of that in our discussion today. The oaks in the Santa Monica Mountains are near threatened, and that's gonna be with Corcus lobata, the valley oak, and least concerned, and that's gonna be Corcus agrifolia, but they still have these issues, right? Of a primarily invasive and problematic species, as well as uh, genes and limits to gene dis uh, dispersal and diseases. So we're, like I said, we're talking about Corcus agrifolia and Corcus lobata, coast live oak and the valley oak. And those are gonna be in two family, or two subgroups within the, the genus Corcus, right? So one of them is the subgroup of Corcus and that's where Corcus lobata is the valley oak. And uh, if you look at this graph, what it does is it breaks down phylo, phylogenetically what the major conservation issues are and like uh, and what categories they are. So most things in Corcus aren't of concern, they're least concern, like they're, they're doing fine. Corcus lobata is not. Corcus lobata is in that near threatened category. It's not like it wouldn't be considered rare, but it, it's it's getting to that point. And the other group then is going to be Lobatiae. And Lobatiae has Corcus agrifolia in it. It's, it's a little confusing. Uh, I believe the common group is going to be the red oaks. But um, Corcus agrifolia is least concerned. And so as you can see, like, there's less least concern individuals in that group. It is a more at-risk group, but it's not as, um, there's, there's some Chinese varieties of oaks that are really in trouble. But fortunately for us, a lot of the oaks that we're gonna be talking about aren't quite at that endangered or threatened status yet. So let's go back to Corcus lobata in the subgroup Corcus. So as you can see in Southern Cal uh, in California, this is the valley oak, it's one of our endemic oaks. It very much goes around the central valley of California. It's a Southern extent is gonna be in the Santa Monica mountains, right? There are individuals that go to the, to the islands and throughout the LA basin. Um, I tend to think of the most Southern extent of Corcus lobata as like Chesboro, but it's, it's definitely possible that prior to col uh, colonization that it went even farther than that. And you're gonna be able to tell by what it is by the lobes leaves, it's uh, drought deciduous, right? So it's gonna drop its leaves um, or winter deciduous, I guess, if you're up north. So um, acorns, the, the way you're gonna key out a Corcus lobata from a Corcus agrifolia, you're gonna to wanna to look at the entire tree, the gestalt of the tree, how it's kind of, how its appearance is, right? You're gonna to wanna to have the acorns and the leaves, the leaves are gonna be really diagnostic. They're, they're lobed. They don't look really resemble the Corcus agrifolia at all. To me, that alligator bark is kind of emblematic, but I, I try not to look at bark when I'm IDing an oak. It, it's really about those leaves and the acorn and then the entire gestalt of the tree. Okay, so let's go to the subgroup Labadie, and that's gonna be Corcus agrifolia, the coast live oak. And just like its name, it's really hugging the coast of California. If you're down in certain parts of Orange County and San Diego County, there's a different subspecies of uh, Corcus agrifolia. Most of the, sub, all of the subspecies of Corcus agrifolia that we're gonna be talking about, and I think that would exist at Palos Verdes, I could be wrong, and like, Long Beach and stuff would be the Corcus agrifolia variety agrifolia. 
and it, it's going to be really apparent by its tooth margins and its evergreen. And this does dip down into Baja California, whereas like the Quercus uh, lobata kind of, you know, ends more or less at Chesboro. Um, in like in the Santa Monica Mountains, this one dips all the way down to Southern, uh, to Baja. So the acorns are super diagnostic, really like longer. The leaves, um, agra, like sharp folia leaves, right? Kind of curled, cusping. It's gonna have like really diagnostic um, trichomes inside the pits of some of the um, veins on the leaves. They have these really beautiful catkins. I mean, sort of the, you know, Corcus lobata, but like, um, I just get so happy when I see catkins on these um, on these trees, and they're just covered in bees. I know they're wind pollinated, right? But they're just ah, it's so beautiful. Here's a Corcus agrifolia I found uh, close to Aliso Creek in the San uh, San Fernando Valley. Just really exposed roots, not doing, not thriving, but um, it's you know most of the tissue on that tree looked alive, and it was just kind of a funky look at those roots. Not very deep though, right? You 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 see those really bad drawings of oak trees and the roots go super deep into the ground. That's not really how oak trees operate. They typically more shallow rooted, but um, we'll talk more about their ecology in a bit. They're really fascinating. Okay, yeah, so let's dive right into it, right? So the ecology of a coast live oak, Corcus agrifolia, variety agrifolia, they like kind of clay to well-drained soils. So that runs the gamut of all different sorts of soils. They're really adaptive. I, I typically see them in uh, ravines, canyons, more mesic, typically north facing conditions. Now, I'm going to describe a lot of ecological conditions that can vary from study to study, um, person to person. So um, take a lot of these with a grain of salt, right? Not you, your observations might not be the same for Corcus agrifolia or Corcus lobata. So in the Santa Monica Mountains, right, typically north facing slopes, right? And they can be kind of like in Chaparral, like in the Verdugo Hills, they can kind of blend in with a lot of the Ceanothus Chaparral, but they can also be kind of riparian in those ravines. And then of course, <laughs> oak woodlands. So Quercus agrifolia is found in oak woodlands, who would have guessed it? And some kind of species that I see as kind of co-occurring are um, in the genus Ribes, Rosa Californica, Toxicocon dendron, diversolobium, um, one of my favorite plants, um, Artemisia douglasiana, uh, Salvius bathycea, and of course the so gorgeous Venagasia carpoides, um, which is just uh, such a cool canyon sunflower. Really love it. So, and here's a great picture of that canyon sunflower, right? Like just carpeting this post fire landscape. And uh, some of these oak trees are doing, they're chugging along, right? They're, um, they just had, the, this was after the Woolsey fire. Uh, maybe, I think this was a year after the Woolsey fire. So you're seeing epicormal resprouting that's from the stem tissue, right? These, some of them are gonna make it. A lot of the uh, juvenile oak trees completely dead, right? The things that are under five, 10 years typically don't make wildfires. But once you pass 10, 15, 20 years, then your chances are much higher. Some of these are gonna do fine. And as you can see, the Canyon sunflower is really thriving here. There's tons of hummingbird sage everywhere. Um, that area had a great population of Poa secunda and Stipopulcra. Um, just a lot of the stuff in the understory does surprisingly well post wildfire, as the invasives do. So we'll, and we'll talk about more about that. So let's talk about the ecology of Corcus lobata, right? So the valley oak, these, these have a preference for really deep soils with access to the water table. The roots are kind of shallow like the Corcus agrifolia, but they do reach deeper than the Corcus agrifolia. And you'll typically see Corcus lobata in kind of more grasslands, prairie, oak savanna. There was a really extensive history of indigenous folk utilizing Corcus lobata and kind of managing these um, these oak woodlands of Corcus lobata, you know, I'm sure with Corcus agrifolia as well. But because of that, and because of ranching and where the Corcus lobata prefers to grow, it's had a really extensive history of colonialism and recent disturbance due to primarily cattle. And so, you know, there's a lot of research that goes back and forth. Do cattle help or hurt oak woodland? We haven't had cattle in the Santa Monica Mountains since the late 1970s, I believe. Um, there's some, you know, horses and stuff like that. Um, but 
I wouldn't say they're really a factor in the San Joaquin Mountains anymore, but they have done, the cattle ranching did do pretty extensive damage in certain areas. Um, or maybe they didn't. And like those kind of, those were also developed and lived upon by indigenous folks. So like that kind of nexus between like, was it, was it cattle, was it colonialism, um, or were these places perhaps villages or like seasonal villages? It, it's really hard to tell, but in the case for Corcus Lobata, right? A lot of these habitats have had a recent history of degradation. And so species that you might see around Corcus Lobata habitat in the Santa Monica Mountains, there's things like Stipopulcra, Schultzia californica, Amenanthe pendulaflora, Salvia leucophila, and a lot of invasive annual forbs and grasses, uh, Brassica nigra, Hirschfeldia incana, Cardius pycnocephalus, um, Avena fatua, Avena barbata, Bromus rubens, Bromus rup madratensis, Bromus diandris. The list just kind of goes on and on ad nauseum. They're really affected by invasive species. Let's see, here's a um, Corcus lobata. I believe this was an Angora Hills in just kind of a sea of Avena. Um, I think it was Avena fatua, could have been Avena barbata, but a lot of really rare calicordis in this area as well. I kind of like debated throwing calicordis in there as well, because I typically see different calicordis species with the Corcus lobata, but calicordis can almost be anywhere. So, and there's a lot of different species, but yeah, really beautiful. Um, it just has that look to it that's so different from a Corcus agrifolia. I, I, I tell students that if you look at a Corcus lobata, like it'll just, you'll see through it so much better. And when it comes to remote sensing and satellites, you're probably, it's gonna have a different spectral signature as well because it has so much more spacing to it than a Quercus agrifolia would have. But I've also seen them intermixed and co, uh, living sympatrically together. And they kind of form this really thick, Corcus agrifolia and Corcus lobata right next to each other. And they form this really thick canopy. So um, that's not always the case. Plants don't listen to human rules. Okay, so where are we talking about, right? So we just talked about who, that was all the who, who's who. Now we're gonna talk about the where, Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area. This is one of the largest urban national parks in the US. It's huge. And if you haven't been, I highly recommend it. I'm obsessed with the place. So, uh, and it's about to get, prob it's probably gonna get bigger too with the Rim of the Valley projects. Hopefully that goes forward and we'll be expanding into the Santa Monica, uh, into the um, Santa Susana and like the, around the San Fernando Valley, around to San Gabriel Mountains as well. Really spectacular, beautiful place. It ranges from zero to 3000 feet above sea level. And that's like on the lower end, it does go higher than 3000 feet as well. It has over 500 miles of trails, and this will be important when we talk about community science. There's over a thousand plant species in 26 communities. A, a, a few dozen of those are endemic. To, it can only be found in the San Monica Mountains, and dozens of them are rare, threatened, endangered plants. So this is the National Parks work in um, vegetation mapping in the Santa Monica Mountains, right? And this is kind of a hard um, map to kind of just throw at you without um, you know, a little bit of a takeaway. So what I really want um, to look for is gonna be the more brown in color is gonna be that coast live oak and the lighter brown is gonna be the valley oak. It's not much of that map, if you can notice. Um, there's, there's pockets of it. There's pockets of it up in Chesboro, Upper Las Virginis. Upper Las Virginis is gonna be this kind of like middle part. There's pockets of valley oak populations and over to the right is you're gonna have like Malibu Creek State Park and that's gonna have some Corcus agrifolia. But um, Corcus agri oak woodland's not doing very well um, off, the, um, off, off to the left by Camarillo. Um, it's not doing very well around Malibu. Um, there's certain areas that the Corcus um, agrifolia, Corcus lobata, even Corcus berbudifolia, the scrub oak, they're not doing great. Um, the, but there are areas that, you know, have some even weirder stuff too. Some, some species that we're not going to be talking about, but um, there's, yeah. So this just give you, give you an idea of the kind of space we're working with and all the different plant communities um, in the Santa Monica Mountains. All right, so what's the issue, right? So I, I mentioned that oaks are in decline. Uh, some of you might recognize this as kind of like bark beetle infestation, right? 
um, which is one of the things we're gonna be talking about. So why is it in decline? Why, are, why is cork in trouble? Frequent wildfires is one thing we're gonna talk about. Uh, these systems have adapted to live with infrequent fire, wildfires, typically on the scale of every 30 to 150 years. This is very different than the wildfire regimes of Northern California. Now they're happening every decade and less. So more frequent wildfires issue. Beetles and fungus, we have a few, a handful of invasive bark beetles, and they have these really interesting symbiotic relationship with fungus that they then introduce to the trees. Now, there are native bark beetles to a lot of these species of corcus, but the invasive ones are bringing new fungi species and um, they're coming in larger numbers because the weakened oak trees and it's not a good situation when it causes dieback in other in co-occurring tree species, not just corcus, right? Which will then change the fire regime and then could lead to habitat type conversion with more invasive species. So uh, what you'll kind of see in this talk is all these things are kind of related, weird. Ecology is kind of like this network of different related issues. Mega drought. So me adding mega to anything makes it way more intense. So we've had the because of like man-made climate change, we've had these like increasing series of really severe droughts and they've been hitting LA particularly hard, right? Where we, we already have so little water in Los Angeles, 15 inches of precipitation a year. That's, that number is really funny because it very rarely gets to 15 inches per year. And it's usually much below that. I guess that's how averages work. Um, and we get our water all the way from Owens Valley, 200 miles north. So a lot of the water that we do have, um, it, it's pretty infrequent already without man-made climate change. And this has like been getting worse and worse since the industrial revolution of these series of droughts. And they've been impacting these otherwise drought adapted species, Quercus agrifolia and Quercus lobata. Quercus agrifolia perhaps being a little more drought adapted than Quercus lobata. Um, Quercus lobata is at the southern end of its population. Quercus agrifolia, like I said before, goes dips down all the way into Baja, California. So having less water might be something, it's probably something Quercus agrifolia is a little more adapted to than Quercus lobata. And we'll talk more about that. Man-made climate change, again, this is changing the composition of um, of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, as well as, I, I didn't add this, but like pollution from like nitrogen as well is promoting certain conditions for invasive species. So climate change doesn't just impact, you know, wildfire and annual mean precipitation, but it can also affect the conditions in which certain invasive species thrive. And the other thing that maybe you didn't expect me to talk about that I kind of mentioned from that 2002 Oak Global Oak Report is isolation and fragmentation, right? You're thinking like, Richard, like Quercus agrifoli is wind pollinated. They don't really like, I don't think a road is really gonna stop them from pollinating, but it's, it's a lot bigger than that. And some of the fragmentation is quite dramatic for the oak species that we're gonna be talking about. All right, so let's get into wildfire. This is something that I really like to research a lot. So when I was looking for like my master's thesis, I knew it was gonna involve wildfire. Ignition sources. This is a big part of wildfire that I think gets overlooked in the fire community where they wanna focus on words like fuel, which to me doesn't, that doesn't mean much. What I really wanna talk about is ignition sources. A lot of these fires that have happened in the Santa Monica mountains, they're, they're quite large, right? And Wolsey, I, I think is bigger than all of these. I, I haven't, I forget the acreage for the Woolsey fire, but so some of the causes, power lines, arson, unknown, hot coals being dumped, more power lines, more arson. So these ignition sources are becoming more and more common as we move into the future. Folks throwing out cigarettes out of their car. Um, you know, a lot of the Santa Monica mountains have roads that go through them. So folks can just litter all they want. Um, power lines. This is something that, you know, even recently when Malibu was having like a lot of wind, Edison just, I think it was Edison or SoCal Gas. I forget which, maybe someone else here knows, but they just shut off the power lines and the power in a lot of the, around Malibu. So they're getting adaptive with how dangerous power lines are in these chaparral oak woodland environments. A little too late, um, but, and then another thing, cars, I've 
worked with folks where we roll our truck into cheat grass, um, Bromus tectorum, and then the car engine will start a spark on the cheat grass. And we have to quickly put that out. But um, this is happening with tons of people that are driving their vehicles where they shouldn't be driving. It's a big problem. And another thing in Los Angeles is homeless encampments. Um, I don't want to seem unempathetic because, you know, we have a really bad housing crisis in Los Angeles and Long Beach. And um, these folks often have nowhere else to live. And they're also like many are also suffering from um, drug addiction and mental mental health issues. Nothing that you and I are going to solve right now. It's important to recognize these people are surviving <laughs> in the areas they're surviving in and they need compassion. But at the same time, I've stomped out wildfire or I've stomped out potential wildfires from you know people just trying to survive, not like camping for fun. Like these people are just trying to stay warm at night. It's still an issue and it's still leading to wildfires. There is one in, um, I think in the Hollywood Hills that was a homeless encampment that kind of just exploded and got really bad. The other issue is arson. So th these don't necessarily have to be folks that are homeless, but um, arson is another really severe issue that we have. I mean, it's just something that's, in my opinion, going to happen when you have such a large population as Los Angeles. So wildfire, right? So this map is outdated because <laughs> the Woolsey fire, but um, and for those of you that don't know, the Woolsey fire happened in 2018 in the Santa Monica Mountains. I was there when it started. I was in Upper Los Virginis looking at an endangered population. I was, I was in that orange, top orange area, the dark orange, almost red area. I was looking for the San Fernando Valley spine flower and I saw smoke and I called my boss and I was like, hey, this is what's happening. And he's like, do you need a, do you need a evac helicopter? And I'm like, oh no, I think I'm fine. I'll just walk back to my car. I walked back to my car. I drove home and that night, all I could see in the hillsides was just glowing red embers. Um, that was really rough. That was probably one of the roughest parts of my life was the Woolsey fire. Um, it was really severe. As you can see, a lot of these areas have are no stranger to wildfires. And the what, what this map is showing is the fire return interval, right? So areas around Malibu in that dark red, they get really frequent wildfires on the scale of less than every 10 years. And this is not um, the typical uh, sh uh, fire return interval for Chaparral. Something that's more typical would be like the darker yellow to green. Um, those are going to be your more typical for Chaparral and Oak Woodland in, in the, at least the Santa Monica Mountains. Now, Chaparral can pop back after a, a fire return interval of 15 and more years, like if it's between 15 and 30. There can usually be recovery, but at the same time, if, if your fire return interval gets too short, it's going to promote favorable conditions for things like uh, Bromus diandris, Brassica nigra, Hirschfeldia and Canada, those invasive species can more easily um, take over. And then they just promote wildfire even more because they burn so easily, they burn cool. And then when you're burning cool, you're not burning hot enough for a lot of those chaparral shrubs to be able to re-sprout post-germination. Y'all thought you were just getting a, an oak talk. Well, throwing some chaparral in there too. So wildfires are becoming more frequent. Now, oak trees, corcus, a lot of them are fire adapted and it depends but that depends on like drought stress bark beetles and co-occurring invasive species right and are, are these even high severity high burn severity fires so really really hot crown burning wildfires crown meaning at you know, the top of the plant oak trees can come back from them and sometimes they do surprisingly well but they got to be limited in their drought stress Bark beetles can't be as big as a thing, right, in their habitat. And I'm not talking about just oak trees, right? Bark beetles, a lot of the bark beetles we're dealing with right now in the Santa Monica Mountains, they're going after willows, they're going after sycamores, they're going after um, like things like Tree of Heaven and um, Ricinus communis, right? They're going after other co-occurring um, plants, but they create more dead material, right, which will then burn in the wildfire and kind of change the fire return interval. So kind of complicated with the, the mixture of 
wildfire, drought, beetles, invasive species, and how those all play together. Also ignition sources and population close by. Wildfire can cause type conversions to favor invasive species. Like I said, like invasive species kind of promote this cool fire that'll burn through the area. And it'll also happen more frequently as a lot of these are annuals that will just come back, right? If you have a, a healthy native grassland, it's gonna be made of a lot of in the, uh, annual forbs, but it's gonna be a lot of perennial grasses and they burn differently than your annual grasses. So that's gonna change the fire conditions as well to promote these kind of annual fires. It's, it's a little weird to think of it that way, but annual weeds, they kind of don't mind a fire every year. That's kind of a lot of how like the, it, the Eurasian steppes work in places in Spain and stuff is like, there's can be more frequent fires and a lot of these annual plants are adapted for that. Here's a system I wanted to show what, and um, this was after the Woolsey fire as well, but as you can see all this dead Brassica nigra, this thrived post Woolsey fire, the Brassica nigra, it just all spread out and it was green and yellow and tons of people were pulling over their cars and taking pictures of the invasive plants. and. Um, this is like a few, this is after, so I guess this was two years after the Woolsey fire, or at least one full year after the Woolsey fire. And so all that Brassica nigra has now died. And the, there is Brassica nigra coming up, but it's not going to get as tall. It doesn't have all those nutrients that it did post wildfire. And that is going to burn super easily. And so those oak trees, a lot of them are, um, survived the Woolsey fire. There's some dieback you can see in some of them may survive, some of them look a little drought stressed, some of them look fine, like they just got scorched. But that's pretty normal for, um, for a lot of California native grasslands and savannas too, is for the trees to just get scorched. Um, these fires can be low intensity um, for oak woodland savannas, right? If they burn on a more regular, um, if they bor burn as, some of them are supposed to. But at the same time, like the oaks can also be adapted for the bur high burn severity. So it kind of runs the gamuts between the two and uh, what research you're looking at, what region of California you're looking at. Bark beetles, right? So the, the one that we're kind of hope, it, you know, we're not finding it yet in the Santa Monica Mountains. That could change. Um, and it might've changed already, and I just don't know it, but the invasive gold spotted oak borer has been making its way from Arizona to California. And it, it's a pretty big issue in, the, um, in California that a lot of people are pretty worried about. And it has this complex relationship with a, a fungi symbiont that it consumes the fungus and it also brings it from tree to tree. And it can cause a lot of oak, more, uh, large oak mortality, right? These oaks can live often 200, 300 years, maybe some a little older than that. And things like this can, and if they're already drought stressed and maybe they've had too many frequent wildfires, something like an oak beetle, can, uh, a gold spotted oak borer can really bring down a population of really pristine oak woodland. So here's a map right now of the oak spot, uh, gold spotted oak borer. Um, notice Los Angeles is kind of just out of it, but it's unfortunately gotten to the San Gabriels and um, Santa Ana's and the Peninsula Ranges and stuff. But as of now, the Santa Monica seems to be clear of it, but we don't know how much longer that's gonna last for. And we are getting um, other invasive um, beetle species, which are impacting willows, sycamores, um, other co-occurring um, native and non-native tree species. And that's gonna change the fire regime of an area. So where it won't matter as much if the oaks have the invasive beetles or not, their landscape has been affected by all these dead trees now because of the co-occurring species. And then you have things like drought and um, Rosie Daggett has been really leading the, the effort on this for, for decades now on showing how drought um, and bark beetles as recently are affecting oak trees and especially in areas like Malibu Creek uh, State Park where there's just massive dieback of oak trees due to drought. Um, again, we get these like extended drought years where year after year, we're not getting enough rain and it stresses these trees out that are normally drought adapted and it weakens their defenses, not only from things like um, bark beetles, but other insectivorous insect, I mean, other herbaceous, um, 
herbivore insects as well, sorry. Um, and, uh, and fungi as well. So it can really stress these trees out and just push them past the point of no return. Or they're so drought, drought stressed when they do get a deluge of water, like just a ton of water at once, they can't handle it and they fall over because they're, 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 anatomy is so heavily impacted by drought that when they do get water, they just can't sustain to continue living. And so they just fall over after a really big rain. It can be a pretty big problem. So I, I wanted to show, this is a really famous um, oak that um, we had in the um, Paramount Ranch in the Santa Monica Mountains, where a lot of these areas were really struggling from drought. And so these long lived trees, which we expect to have for decades and decades, when the Woolsey fire came, these trees were so drought stressed, they, they just couldn't take it. And I, I did see some regrowth on this particular tree and they tried to bring in a tree surgeon and all this complex stuff, but it didn't make it. And a lot of the trees in Paramount Ranch didn't make it, it was pretty bad. So this just goes to further show how drought and wildfire can kind of interplay as well. So this is something that, you know, I study a little bit of dendrochronology myself too, researching growth rings and trees. And this is something that we often use called the Palmer Drought Severity Index. And it's just a really good way to demonstrate what drought is and how it's working on a annual level. So as you can see here, the, the green areas are when we, they're years that we have rain. And the dips, the orange parts, those are years that we have drought. And so we've, some could say that, you know, when we had average rain in 2019, that we kind of got out of that drought. I've heard interpretations that it was just an average year and it didn't pull us out of that drought. And that we've almost still been in a drought since 2013, or a lot of the plants have been drought stressed since 2013. So these really long droughts that are just inter interspersed with just kind of regular years um, are getting really severe. Another really long drought that you can see was in the late, um, was in the mid to um, the mid eighties to like the early nineties. And in, in my sagebrush samples, when, when I was doing tree ring, uh, tree ring research in sagebrush in Owens Valley, you see these kind of drought signals as well, where um, the, the woody plants are really affected by these long years of drought. And this kind of, these changing patterns since the industrial revolution kind of goes into climate change as well as we're having more erratic precipitation events. We're having longer summers, less, and I don't wanna say less rain because that's not always the case, right? But um, these are also creating more favorable conditions for invasive species. And a lot of that can be ex uh, exhaust from, um, from fossil fuel combustion, right? As more, we have more phosphate, nitrogen, in the air and that's you know promoting conditions for invasive species but also the amount of co2 and the annual mean temperature as well which is then going to further modify the fire regime so as you can see here this is a projection of what the climate's going to be like in 2080 uh 2099 some of you are like i'm not even thinking about that but like I think a lot of like the millennials and younger, like we're definitely kind of thinking about this future. I mean, this is the world we're being left. So these kind of like really severe conditions where we're getting the same sort of temperatures as Southern Arizona. And I, I love screaming till my horse is, my, my throat is hoarse that Los Angeles is not a desert. I don't know if I'll be able to say that in 2080. I think once we have the same annual mean temperature and precipitation as southern Arizona, I think at that point we're probably classified as a desert. As of now, we're not. We're, we're coastal sage scrub, oak woodland, chaparral, Mediterranean climate, but I don't know what the future holds. Some of the further models have predicted that Los Angeles is going to resemble a lot more like southern Baja California. Right, um, and as you can see, there's other examples that, um, you know, maybe like Southern, the Yucatan Peninsula might more, look more like Tampa, um, parts of um, uh, Northern Texas are gonna, uh, or Washington's gonna resemble more Northern Texas, parts of Denver would look more like o Oklahoma. Some of this stuff's pretty scary, right? Um, but, you know, a lot of people like 
Baja, California. It's got some really cool plants, like that kind of cactus scrub habitat, and there's some cool coastal sage scrub and oak woodlands and stuff. But uh, so we would look like Baja, California, but without the cool plants. That's kind of, we wouldn't get all these like really cool funky cacti and um, scrub plants. Uh, we'd kind of be more like the Great Basin is now, but like without a lot of the snow and colder precipitation. We would just be fields. If you've been to like the Modoc Plateau um, and like around Susanville and stuff, it's just become inundated with Bromus tectorum. And it's just miles and miles and miles of invasive species. And that's kind of our future for the Santa Monica Mountains and a lot of um, the San Gabriels and Santa Susanas. If it's not already getting to that point now, it's definitely going to get to that point in the future where wildfires are just an annual thing in all of the places, not just like heterogeneously. It's kind of just homogeneously wildfires every single year. Um, and then the other part <laughs> that, that I wanted to talk about that you might not be suspecting is an issue is um, fragmentation. I think everyone can kind of acknowledge that urbanization and habitat destruction, deforestation would obviously impact uh, coast live oaks and valley oaks. But something that we don't typically think about with oak trees is how roads, urbanization, um, deforestation, these things isolate oak trees, right? Um, so here I have this map of like the proposed um, Liberty Canyon Wildlife Crossing um, that's gonna go over the 101. They have like the Corganville Tunnel, which would let like really charismatic animals like mountain lions cross over. But what do we do for oaks, right? Like a wildlife crossing probably wouldn't help an oak, but um, it will help some species, which is cool. It's like, I can't like, you know, the folks really get excited about mountain lions. So I don't wanna like bum them out for that. It, it, anything is better than nothing. But research out of UCLA, looking at Corcus lobata in the Santa Monica Mountains, it's genetically isolated from the rest of Corcus lobata and the rest of the state. We have really unique Corcus lobata in the Santa Monica Mountains. It is more, Corcus lobata already is kind of like, um, of, I don't want to say vestige, but it was adapted for kind of wetter times, right? And the Corcus lobata that we have in the Santa Monica Mountains, um, it's the southern extent of it, but it's also like kind of well adapted for living at the southern extent, but that could quickly change with climate change, right? And then also like prior to colonization and when like indigenous folk might have been like bringing acorns all across the state and helping with genetic diversity, that's not happening as much anymore. And we've cut down quite a bit of Corcus, agro, uh, Corcus lobata and Corcus agrifolia, but Corcus lobata habitat because it's good for ranching, it's good for farming. Um, I mean, most of the Central Valley Corcus lobata population is gone forever. And that could have lent itself to some of the genetic diversity that would have been coming to the Corcus lobata of the Santa Monica Mountains, but that's just not happening anymore. So we have this really isolated population of Corcus lobata in the San Monica Mountains now. So another thing with habitat fragmentation is also disturbing scrub jay habitat. So scrub jays are one of the best ways in which oaks disperse. So you may be thinking, well, hey, what about acorn woodpeckers? It's like in their name. Acorn woodpeckers are really territorial and they like hanging out in the same area. They also store their acorns <laughs> in holes in trees called granaries. And um, <laughs> I don't know about you, but I don't see too many oak trees growing out of other trees inside of granaries. But scrub jays, what makes them cool is they spread these acorns to areas and they think they're so smart. They cache them in like rock crevices and like in, in the ground and stuff. And they think like, oh, I'm totally gonna come back for this acorn and eat it later. And most of the time they forget about it. And so the, the cool thing about scrub jays is like, Acorns, when they normally disperse, they're, and the oak trees have these masting years, like every few years, they're favorable conditions where a ton of oak trees will simultaneously kind of reproduce, right? And so a lot of those acorns fall right under the, the maternal tree. And this is where you're gonna have the highest population of mule deer, which are gonna eat the sapling oak trees and the seedling oak trees. You're gonna have um, rabbits, you're gonna have fungus, 
from um, that the adults are kind of adapted to living with, but it's gonna heavily impact the, uh, the babies. You're gonna have disease that maybe the adults are handling, but the younger ones can't. They're gonna be really competitive for shade. Um, so they're gonna have to literally be little skinny twigs waiting for an adult oak tree to fall over. And then they have to race to take its place. So there's a lot of competition in these oak woodlands, but if a scrub jay gets the acorn, it can fly a really far distance but you don't know if there's access to water in those really far areas. You don't know if there's going to be like a nurse plant nearby that can kind of help you out for a few years, like provide shelter and stuff while you're kind of making it through that awkward, you know, five to 15 year old stage. But it's far enough away from the disease and predators that a lot of oaks that are dispersed by scrub jays have the better chance of survival. It's a little counterintuitive, but um, Scrub jays are really important for oak, oak populations, even though they're one of the leading predators of acorns. So if you're cutting off scrub jay populations and you're not in, it's not favorable conditions for scrub jays to live in, or maybe they're isolated to one neighborhood and there's some sort of barrier to another neighborhood, you may be cutting off the genetic diversity of oak trees because you're impacting scrub jay populations. Now, there's other animals that you know will distribute acorns, such as the California gray squirrel. But again, they're kind of territorial and they, they usually are really arboreal. So they need these continuous canopies. And we've kind of destroyed a lot of those continuous ca canopies in the Santa Monica mountains because of like large roads and like neighborhoods and stuff. Okay, so now that I've like depressed all of you, so how bad is the problem, right? And then how bad is are the oaks really doing in the Santa Monica Mountains? And how can we ex study the extent of the population decline or dieback, right? How, how bad is the problem? So one way we could do it is by utilizing community science. And I'm a huge fan of that. Some of you might be thinking like, I thought it was called citizen science. We're kind of moving away from that term because it's a little exclusionary. So community science is like basically like democratizing like data collection. So anyone with access to a cell phone, um, a laptop, camera, even like a recording device can contribute to community science in different ways. So the first way I'm going to talk about is iNaturalist, and I'll talk about CalFlora, which I'm sure a lot of you are already familiar with, right? So this is the Santa Monica Mountains with all the <laughs> observations on iNaturalist, and it's just kind of this flurry of different large taxa, right? Plants and animals and fungi and stuff. And it's really hard to decipher. So we have our bounding box mostly around the Santa Monica Mountains. So we're gonna filter just for oak trees. Now, if we look at this, there's 35 different species of oak tree in this area, that's not true. Maybe for like, if we include the San Gabriels and stuff, but again, a lot of those are hybrids. And then there's also like weird landscaping oak trees that are being thrown in that number. So I'm a little dubious. So if we go down to the species for oaks and we really limit our bounding box, it shrinks down to about 15, right? And if I cross-reference that number with the Santa Monica Mountains Wildflower app and website, which if you haven't used before, I highly suggest it, even in, in Palos Verdes and Long Beach and stuff, it's still a great app. That shrinks it down. They suggest from the flora that, you know, Art and Barry at UCLA, they were former herbarium directors and stuff. Um, they suggest about six species of oak tree that commonly occur in the Santa Monica Mountains. There's more hybrids in the Santa Monica Mountains, but that's a decent number. iNaturalist says about 15. I think a lot of those not only are hybrids, but um, also kind of um, landscaping as well, that, like things from Europe. But the top two species as we see are coast live oak and valley oak, and that shouldn't be too surprising. And so again, we're gonna create this bounding box and we're gonna limit our search to the top two, and that's gonna be coast live oaks. And there's about 920 observations. A lot of those are gonna be like planted by people in like residential neighborhoods, but not all of them. A lot of them are in, um, you know, like wild spaces. But what's being recorded on iNaturalist, right? So if we zoom in into Malibu Creek State Park, um, I don't know about you, but um, I see a pattern. It's following roads, right? It's following roads and trails. So 
shock of people that are on roads and trails record the things that they find on roads and trails, but that's not um, catching all of the Corcus agrifolia that exist. You can even see some of the Corcus agrifolia like in between the roads and stuff, but those individuals aren't being counted on iNaturalist. These are simply just things that people are noticing. Well, I mean, you could do population mapping by kind of guessing that they're in between those spaces. But if we're looking for like dieback, if we're trying to figure out how severe the problem is, maybe this isn't the best case. Let's see if like Corcus lobata is a little better though. So we're gonna limit our search of Corcus lobata to the Santa Monica mountains. And like I said, it kind of like, it dips a little into Topanga State Park, but it's mostly in like Chesboro and Agora Hills and stuff. So. That's where a lot of our corpus nobata is gonna be in the Santa Monica Mountains, not totally surprising. Um, if we zoom into Upper Las Virginis by Lasky Mesa, um, we're going to see again, that same pattern. People are recording oak trees that they're finding next to the trails. Again, you can see there's oak trees that are in between those trails, but that's not what folks are, um, that's not what folks are entering into iNaturalist, which is totally okay. I'm not telling people with, get off trail stay on the trail like don't don't create social trails but like at the same time how powerful is this data if um how powerful is this data if we're just recording oak trees on on these trails okay so let's say you're like well iNaturalist is a little shaky like there's a lot of non-experts on iNaturalist um the data is not always great like you can use research grade data but i've seen personally i use iNaturalist all the time and I've seen iNaturalist data, which was research grade, which I've then had to go back and debate them on because I knew it was landscaping or I knew it was artificial, like it was a plant that was brought from like a different place. Like it didn't belong, it wasn't reproducing naturally. So not everything research grade is research grade on iNaturalist. So let's say though Calflora is like where the botanists go, right? A lot of, um, though you can transfer records from iNaturalist to Calflora. And I implore any of you that use iNaturalist, do this. Please do this. Add your records from iNaturalist to Calflora. You will be helping botanists all across the state. So it's a really fantastic thing that they did. But let's say you want to like use Calflora because Calflora is like coolest thing ever. So we're going to go on Calflora. We're going to enter in um, Corcus for Los Angeles County and for Ventura County. We're getting 35 species for Los Angeles County. This is including like the San Gabriel Mountains and a um, bit of South LA as well for some things that we probably don't get in the Santa Monica Mountains. And for Ventura County, that number is probably closer because that's including a lot of hybrids too and a lot of landscaping folks. Um, so uh, the truth is probably somewhere in between. Or I, if I had to, I personally, I think it's just six. I'm, I'm not much of a, you know, there's a lot of hybrids, whatever. It, I guess hybrids are important to record and such. But um, so it's probably like slightly less than 21 though. And so if we look on Califlora, and I'm, I think this is for Corcus agrifolia, right? So this is the Corcus agrifolia in the Santa Monica mountains. Um, we're gonna zoom in. They have this really cool feature where you can see the soil depth. So I just wanted to play around with it. And so this is that same, or not the same area. This is by King Gillette Ranch. But um, again, a really similar pattern. Um, a lot of these trails and roads are gonna have the observations for Corcus agrifolia. But the space, and I guarantee if you go to King Gillette Ranch, there's a lot more oak trees than just this. So it's kind of like underrepresenting data, but it's that same issue that um, it's kind of just recording a lot of organisms that are just easily accessible to botanists. So it's not just an, it's not a community science problem. This is a botanist problem too, that we're really just recording things that are close by. So this is Corcus lobata. Um, again, really similar distribution as iNaturalist. Um, so let's zoom into that same place. We have even less observations of Corcus lobata where I know there's definitely individuals here. And then um, they're gonna be just on trails. That's where people are gonna record them, which is okay. I mean, that's just how things work, um, that it's safer and less you know, obtrusive to go off trail to record organisms. But there, there you go for Corcus lobata as well. So it depends on the volunteers and community members that may not be able to distinguish species between Corcus lobata and Corcus agrifolia and Corcus berbutifolia and like, 
um, Cornelius Moleri and like some of the, you know, McDonaldi and some of the other obscure oak species that we can talk about. But like, so it really depends on people being able to ID those different oak trees. And staying on trails isn't just a botanist problem or a problem with community members. Both members kind of like have this problem where we just record things that are on trails. But community science can be a cheap option um, that's really like cost effective for scientific experiments. But at the same time, the data can be variable and questionable. And you really have to sift through the data and clean it up and make sure that it's good enough for um, publishable research. So what about sending a botanist like myself looking quite gopher-esque post wildfire, right? So um, it's, it's totally doable like to send a botanist out into the field and do an extensive field search, but it's expensive. Like you gotta pay for my vehicle, my gas, um, insurance. Um, and then in these habitats, you have things like coxicogon, dendron, diversolobium, and phacelias, which can cause burns. I have a really gnarly phacelia javii burn on my wrist. Um, so those are issues and like possible liabilities when you send out botanists to go do this research. And then there's wildfires. I've been out when there's been wildfires. It's totally a thing that happens for the moment. Um, rattlesnake bites. I've not been bitten by a rattlesnake, um, fingers crossed, but like I see them. Car accidents, which is the major issue of sending out a botanist into the field. And then just the general public of like really grumpy people that don't wanna be, um, that don't understand why you're like wandering around off trail. And so you really wanna limit risk. It's okay to send botanists out to collect this research to get, um, to find out our oaks in trouble but there has to be a cost-effective way where we don't have to send teams and teams of botanists out there that increase the liability and we can limit the risk by just sending a few out. We can send a few out by doing remote sensing. Remote sensing is where it can be an airplane or it can be like a satellite. In this case, we're gonna be talking about LARIAC. And this is um, a program through LA County Planning Office where we're recording remotely sensed imagery from airplanes that are flying over the LA County. And um, it's a really cool data set. Not everyone has access to it. It's pretty exclusionary in that way. Cal State Northridge just got access to it. Um, we're trying to work with CSU Los Angeles so they can get access to it. Um, it's really cool. And it has a resolution of up to four inches. So whether there's, there are data sets you can get access to that are satellite imagery, um, they'll have you know a resolution of maybe a meter typically like 30 meters is pretty normal for freely available data sets. LARIAC in Los Angeles, what they're doing is really incredible. And it's not just imagery. It's also near infrared. Um, sometimes they're even doing uh, LIDAR with a laser that goes from the airplane down to the object and back up. So we can get can the heights of canopy as well. So these are really exciting types of tools that can complement on the ground research, right? So not only do we don't have to send tons of botanists out, we can just send one or two, such as myself in my master's degree, right? We can like, I can just go out into the field, but I can complement my research with remotely sensed data. And this is not a new idea, right? So Santa Clarita was doing this in 2011 with the LARIAC data set. And it's not perfect. Like they had a lot of errors with their um, oak tree sensing. So they, Santa Clarita, like for all the, bad stuff they do environmentally, like New Hall Ranch and stuff. They are doing a lot for oak trees, um, maybe a little too late, but um, so they're doing a lot trying to protect oak trees. And part of that program was sensing oak trees remotely. And I can tell you a lot of what they marked as oaks and like some of these ravines and stuff, they might be oaks, but I also think they're probably Ceanothus, um, Crassifolios probably. Um, and not all of those things that are in neighborhoods are Corcus agrifolia. They might be some other species of tree, maybe not even an oak at all. Um, but so they were doing this, but this is how I kind of got this idea for using this data set was from this project that they did. Really cool stuff. And, but what we could do is look at the, before the 2013 drought, and then kind of up until 2019, before the Woolsey, um, maybe like before 2000, before the Woolsey fire, which had been about December 2018. So it may be like slightly before then, right? Or look at it after the Woolsey fire and see how dieback has been since then. 
So you could just ask a variety of different questions. They tend to send out the LARIAC um, airplane, I think every two years, but it might be every four years. But they also change what they're recording each time they go out and they survey Los Angeles. So again, you can ask a lot of really different interesting questions depending on the data that you're able to get and the time period that you're interested in. And I'm not gonna go too into details of how the technology works, but if, if you want, I can talk to some folks after. So again, I'm not the only one that's done this. JPL and Rosie Daggett and um, RCD SMM, they looked at this in the Santa Monica Mountains. They wanted to see if they could see oak dieback. They wanted to see if they could reclassify vegetation like slightly better. Um, I, I think they might have incorporated LIDAR. I don't know if they incorporated the, um, the four inch resolution remotely sensed imagery. Um, and their data is not perfect, but it, it gave us some really interesting findings in their report. But they, um, they classified the Santa Monica Mountains using this remotely sensed imagery into different like um, plant communities, right? And this, the National Park Service does this, but they do this a lot from, um, some of it from remotely, remotely sensed imagery, but they send teams out. Like I used to work for the National Park Service and I would be sent out to monitor these places. And then we would give that and that data would eventually make itself to the GI analyst, GIS analysts and they would incorporate that into the vegetation mapping, right? A lot of this is gonna be from satellite imagery and kind of complex formulas that are generated from giving pixels from the imagery, various values, and then trying to discern which dominant plant species is in that area. And so from this report, they were able to gather how much of the Santa Monica Mountains is oak woodland, and then how much of that is dying. So from this report, approximately, um, they, they guessed that there's about 600,000 coast live oak trees in the Santa Monica Mountains. Now, this is a really rough number, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, but over 3,000 acres of oak woodland riparian habitat have dead individuals in the Santa Monica Mountain National Recreation Area. This is a massive area, but again, and this number kind of varies a lot as well. So um, this can be improved upon, these numbers, but they're, they're pretty stark. And then what they did find was there was more oak dieback between the years of 2013 and 2016. So like I told you, you can look at different time sets with different data sets. And you can kind of ascertain how many trees are dying in this time period. And that's probably correct. Even if those numbers aren't completely accurate given the technology they were using, those numbers are probably pretty true that between those years that there were significant amounts of dieback. Uh, we were in the throes of a really severe drought. And from their sampling, they were looking at beetles, invasive bark beetles, not only from remotely sensed imagery of dieback and stuff, but they were like on the ground, like collecting beetles and stuff. And they didn't find the gold spotted oak borer, but they did find other invasive um, beetle species, not specifically that target oaks primarily, but they go after other oak species. And they did find you know, a fungus that was infecting um, oaks. So these kind of monitoring efforts are really important, which make this like this sort of reporting that um, Rosie does and the uh, research co conservation district of the Santa Monica Mountains makes it so important. So um, my colleague, Anne-Marie um, Parkinson, um, who got an internship through the Ecological Society of America, worked with one of my advisors, um, Dr. Marty Whittier, at the Santa Monica Mountains. And in 2002, they showed that, or 2020, I'm sorry, 2020, they showed that some of the dieback and count may be slightly different depending on the methodology that you use with the satellite imagery. And that they both suggested that more work needs to be done in the Santa Monica Mountains to see how much of the oaks are, are dying in the Santa Monica Mountains and how much of an impact wildfire regimes are having, how much of an impact drought is having. Rosie's done previous work with wildfires that showed in some places like high severity burns um, that were more frequent than every 30 years. Like I think on the scale of like 10 years later, there was another high burn severity fire. The oaks were fine with almost 100% survival. So, but was that during a drought? It's kind of hard to say. And like, how much does drought play into an effect on that? How much bark beetles play an effect about into that? What about invasive species? There's a restoration ecologist for the National Park Service. Um, 
that is looking at Cardos pectocephalus, the Italian thistle. How is this impacting oak woodlands, right? Um, is, is, you know, and it's a small plant, but it could slightly be changing the fire return interval and the fire's behavior in the oak woodland that perhaps the oaks are not adapted to. And uh, again, a lot of hypotheses being thrown out and we need to test these and look at them. And that's what I'm hoping to do with my further research. Corcus lobata also, and I, I, most of this report that I was previously talking about is Corcus agrifolia. Corcus lobata is an understudied species. And in Southern extent of its range, it's especially understudied. And so the, this is something that that report didn't really look at as it was really hard to discern um, Corcus agrifolia from Corcus lobata. So here comes my question of why do we care about this, right? Which is kind of a funny question to ask a bunch of plant nerds. But um, this is important for management, right? We can better manage these landscapes if we can measure how many trees there are. No one would question why we want to count panda bears. Panda bears are important to count because they're really rare plant, uh, plant. they're really rare bear species and they're important for conservation, right? We count oak woodlands because oak woodlands are important for Southern California and for so many plants and animals. So that's why we count the trees and that's why this research is important. And we wanna know how many dead ones there are. That's important for management. Here's my advisor, um, Dr. Whittier, uh, Marty Whittier looking at oak woodlands and being super professional and awesome. So oak woodlands provide a ton of ecosystem services, right? Not only do like indigenous people like interact with and depend upon oak woodlands for thousands of years, but they also provide services to, um, to us as well. They're really nice, like to a lot of um, settlers as well. Like they're really nice landscapes to kind of picnic under or to like in the case of Topanga to build entire housing complexes in oak woodlands, right? Um, they're just really enjoyable places to be. They provide a ton of shade. They uh, lead to cooling. Um, so Los Angeles has urban uh, heating where we have too much heat because of roads and stuff and oak woodlands can help better manage that by lowering the mean temperature of a surrounding neighborhood, right? And then the ton of animals and plants depend on the oaks as well. And like I said, they depend on them, they're nurse plants. So a lot of like, not only baby oak trees will grow under um, mature oaks, but other plant species is, will depend on mature oak woodlands as well to grow under. So yes, like the oak leaves have tannins in them, which inhibits plant growth, but the plants that are adapted to living under the oak trees, they're important for that. And as you can see, oak woodlands, like riparian systems, they're just thriving. They're oh, so gorgeous. Like I can just hear the water moving and like the frogs and uh, the sound of uh, rocks and the birds and all the scrub jays and wood, uh, woodpeckers. And it's really just idyllic. The habitat, um, it's important habitat. Here's one of my favorite animals in the entire wood that um, big eared wood rat, right? And they build these massive structures. I'm pretty sure. I Maybe I took this picture. Maybe maybe I found this on Google. I forget. But these massive uh, midden structures in oak woodlands that are so common for wood rats. And typically the males will build like smaller ones and the females will build these really big ones. But wood rats are really important for like um, bobcats and um, birds of prey and their um, reptiles as well depend on wood rats and their babies. So and, and these middens also provide habitat for all these animals as well. So they're really cool complex places and oak woodlands help facilitate wood rats as does chaparral, but oak woodlands are, are better. No, I'm kidding. Um, oak trees catch embers. And there's a lot of really cool research being done by um, Dr. John Keeley out of USGS and UCLA on oak trees and their ability to catch embers. But um, people that have lived in Southern California for a while, this isn't really surprising. They have these like really broad canopies, um, especially Corcus agrifolia. And, um, you know, they're, they're, they're important, right? So oak woodlands may tolerate like a more frequent fire regime than something like chaparral, which is more sensitive to too frequent of wildfires. But um, oaks are fire adaptive. They can survive well. And like, they may be the difference between your house completely burning down and not because like a if the oak trees are especially um, spaced well enough away from your house, they may stop embers from going on your roofs. Now I'm not promising anything and some of that's kind of controversial, but oak, oak are really important 
for a wildfire mitigation and should be a part of the conversation. Um, it's hard to talk about conservation without mentioning animals. I much prefer plants, but like animals matter too. Uh, one of the really um, charismatic ones that I'm kind of obsessed with is the California gray squirrel. It's being outcompeted by the um, uh, Eastern fox squirrel. And our native squirrel is especially adapted to living in oak woodlands. And when these get, um, when it suffers hab habitat fragmentation or roads are built, it, it creates conditions in which um, the numbers of California uh, gray squirrels go down. And this is really bad. We're losing California gray squirrels in the Santa Monica Mountains at a, an alarming rate. I don't even know if they occur anymore in Palos Verdes or um, we're losing them in the Verduga Hills. I still see them in certain areas of the San Jose in the um, around the San Fernando Valley, but um, we're losing their habitat really um, severely. And it's not a good situation for a native squirrel. Um, Red-legged frogs, right? They're a huge conservation issue that um, folks are constantly wanting, wanting to do more research on. And red-legged frog habitat in San Monica Mountains is quickly shrinking. I think we only have like less than a handful of populations, um, maybe even less than that. And oak woodlands are primarily where they live in these kind of riparian streams with coast live oaks. And um, we're losing that habitat at an alarming rate. Another animal that, um, you know, the, the steelhead trout like that Los Angeles would love to get back. But again, these kind of riparian habitats, if we can protect them, then we can hope to one day have these migrations kind of return to, um, especially in areas like um, Sycamore Canyon and stuff in the Santa Monica Mountains. I think that's it, maybe Big Sycamore or something like that. But um, I, don't, I don't study fish, but it's interesting to think about. And then of course, the most charismatic of all LA, um, megafauna, right? The mountain lions, super dependent upon really pristine chaparral and oak woodlands. And there is differentiation between males and females preferring one of the over the other. It's been a while since I've seen that research by like um, Dr. Seth Riley out of the National Park Service has been doing a lot of that into the types of habitat that the male, uh, male mountain lions and female mountain lions prefer. But again, these habitats are important for these kind of animals. And if we want to keep megafauna around Los Angeles, then we have to better preserve oak woodlands. Now let's talk about the plants that depend on oaks, right? So we have Fish's milkwort. This is kind of a rare species that I've seen um, in the Santa Monica Mountains that it's not endangered by any stretch, but like it's not common either. And it's definitely CNPS listed. And this is one that almost exclusively depends on oak woodlands. Another one's gonna be Malibu baccarus. Again, you can find it in like not oak woodlands, but like it's something that typically occurs with oak woodlands. And this is an endangered species of plant that almost exclusively exists in the Santa Monica Mountains. I actually think it's the only place that exists in the Santa Monica Mountains. And so um, this baccarus, again, like we lose oak woodlands, we could lose um, acceptable habitat for uh, Malibu baccarus as well. Astragalus brontonii, um, Definitely not an oak woodland obligate. Some of these species might, you know, turn some heads like, oh, I don't think that's definitely an oak obligate. But again, I've seen tons of Astragalus brontonia post wildfire that occurs in oak woodlands, right? And if we stop wildfires and we develop too much, we're cutting off Astragalus brontonia as populations. It thrives post wildfire. And so if um, in a lot of like the around the San Fernando Valley and San Gabriel's and stuff, these wildfire preventions um, that extended out even beyond the fire return interval that was natural, um, it made Astragalus brontonia quite rare. And so this endangered species is important. If we preserve oak woodland habitat, we're also helping preserve um, Astragalus brontonia as well. Nevin's bayberry, this is popular in cultivation, so it's not that much of an at risk of extirpation, but in the very few places that exist in the Santa Monica Mountains, like it's definitely associated with coast, um, coast live oak, really important plant, endangered plant as well. And then something that, you know, a lot of, um, non-flowering plants don't get enough recognition, especially in Southern California, but the Sonoran Maiden Fern, an endangered plant that depends on oak woodland and Encinal Canyon and stuff in the San Monica Mountains. What can you do, right? Um, you can help organizations plant and collect climate adapted oaks. 
So that sounds a little odd, but I'll explain that. With organizations like CNPS in your local chapter, RCDMM, RCDSMM, and then of course with the National Park Service. So there's like these organizations that do oak planting events and nurseries and stuff, and they're really great organizations. And they do watering and weeding and protecting these oaks as they survive. But also like there's been an effort by people like Dr. Sork at UCLA to bring in climate adapted Corcus agrifolia into the Santa Monica Mountains. Oak trees that perhaps can survive climate change of warming, um, warming annual mean temperatures and um, less precipitate, annual precipitation as well. If we bring in, we helped assist bring these oaks into the Santa Monica Mountains, maybe their genes will spread throughout the Santa Monica Mountains and give our oaks a better chance at survival. But don't go doing this yourself. Definitely work with other organizations, other people. Get permission if you ever collect oak, um, oak acorns. Um, it, we're, we're so much more powerful as we work it as a team. Um, gorilla gardeners don't often get a lot done. So you can also adopt an oak. That's a problem, a, a, a program with RCD SMM where you can pay money for other people to take care of an oak, which is like, let's say like you have a hard time like with mobility or um, like getting to a park, you live pretty far away, but you wanna support financially efforts to reforest areas of the Santa Monica mountains or um, wherever you live, right? So you can help support um, oak programs that way. And then of course, shout out to RCD SMM's new program, Bad Beetles, which coordinates community science on iNaturalist to monitor invasive beetle populations in the Santa Monica Mountains. It's really cool. So if you want to learn more, um, there's the, I think it's UCI, and then, so the University of California, Irvine, and then they're the ones that are doing this invasive um, bark beetle project. Um, maybe we can put that in the chat or something later. It's really cool. And the program is called Bad Beetles. And so you can help monitor, and I know a few people on this are in that project now, and you can help monitor oak um, and other tree species. It's really cool. And then I can't do an oak talk without talking about Douglas Ptolemy. He's so cool. And they just wrote a really cool article about his work in um, the New York Times. So please give it a read. Oak trees support a ton of wildlife, and they help sequester a lot of carbon and like birds prefer oak trees over non-native trees that's been showed by Dr. Eric Woods lab at um, Cal State Long, uh, Los Angeles. Like oak trees are just like magnets for animals and plants. So like you wanna help in your backyard, plant an oak tree. It's really cool. And you could be helping like our future, right? Of being, your backyard is now one of the places that supports oak woodlands, just super cool. Plants. So if you're looking for something to read, I definitely suggest him. He's a really cool um, ecologist. Okay, we put our, we're gonna tilt our detective hats back for a second because we're, we're talking about who, it's Oaks, where, Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area. What, we're talking about population decline, which is rather unfortunate. How, um, remote sensing and hiking with or without community science, kind of both, can't, can't, you know, you, you gotta include the community. There's gotta be community. Um, outreach. And then why? Because oaks are good. Oaks are just amazing plants. Um, so with that, I will leave it to questions. So thank you so much for having me. I really, I love talking about oaks and it's really cool to talk with all of you. Oh, thank you. That was a fabulous talk and um, great pictures, um, great information and um, it's uh, amazing to see how uh, you described yourself in the beginning as a former uh, animal person. You obviously have uh, come over to our side, although I think most of us love animals as well and CNPS, which is partly why we support the plants. So um, it's getting relatively late, but um, uh, if people have questions, you can unmute yourself and um, just uh, uh, put, them, put them out. Um, uh, you can also uh, put them in the chat if you're shy to uh, ask them. Um, somebody did mention uh, about not only um, the facilia uh, as a problem, but also uh, singing nettles uh, in disturbed areas. Is that something you've run across a lot? Yeah, so our native um, stinging nettle um, 
Urtica. Is it Urtica? Urtica? It might be. I don't know. But we are, I forget the specific epithet, but we do have a really large stinging nettle. Um, stinging nettle is really fascinating in that once it hits you, it hurts for a few minutes and then it doesn't hurt anymore. It's a chemical, like it, like the needles sting you. And then after a few minutes, it goes away. There's some cultures that like hit themselves with stinging nettle for like anti-inflammatory stuff. Um, I don't have a problem with stinging nettle. I've definitely got hit in the face and the arms and the legs by stinging nettle. Um, and I cry about it for a few minutes and then I'm kind of over it. Uh, Facilia lasts a little longer. But yeah, there is a risk of doing this kind of stuff, which makes doing it behind a computer, as nerdy as that is, that much safer. And that's that's worth having a conversation about. Do you have a problem with uh, poison oak? I used to play, this is a f interesting. So I grew up in Mission Viejo in South Orange mm -hmm. County. I was born in Long Beach actually, but um, I played in Oak Woodlands as a child. Like uh, we, had, we lived next to a really polluted Oak Woodlands mm -hmm. with like tons of garbage and like, it's a really gross place, um, but we loved it and built like tree houses and stuff covered in poison oak. So I played in poison oak as a child. I don't think that's the reason why I don't get poison oak reactions. I think everyone's different, but um, I don't get reactions to poison oak. I don't want to play that game of trying to figure out when and if I'm going to get a reaction, but uh, fingers crossed, knock on wood, I don't get poison oak reactions. I get facelia burns, but yeah, they're okay, similar. Right. They're similar phenols, um, the urshiol and then the um, facilianoids, so. Um, any questions from the audience? Um, does Quercus uh, whiz lazeni occur in the Santa Monica Mountains? And if it does, is there like a good population to go look at? Anderson, it's great to see you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it does. Isn't there, isn't there a population in Thousand Oaks? Or I could be wrong. There's something that's in Thousand Oaks by uh let me i'll talk to you about this later but i think if you look at the santa monica mountains wildflower app if you look at um the flora in the description of wazilia i think they don't they talk about one in like sandstone or like some some like sandstone outcropping uh, uh, zuma canyon in like a outcropping right yeah yeah that's an it, really interesting i've never checked it out um but it would be really cool. Why is it? Um, yeah, that'd be that's a really interesting thing. We should talk more about that later. But it's yeah. good, to hear, good to hear from you, Anderson. Thank you. I changed my name too. Yeah. So sorry. Yeah. For oh. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So in the chat, there's another question. Um, Natalie uh, said, "Thank you, Richard. Love your passion." And she also wants to know how do the bad fungus attack oaks. Can, can you ask that again? I'm sorry. How do the bad fungus attack oaks? Yeah, so um, it's rough because a lot of these oaks are adapted with different, a lot of different species of fungus. And some, um, a lot of these oaks are dependent upon nutrient exchanges with fungal networks, right? It's not something that I'm specifically interested in, but it is really interesting. Um, the difference between ectomycorrhizae and arbuscular mycorrhizae and how they interact with the oaks. But these invasive beetles, they have symbiotic relationship with fungus, fungi where they'll store fungal spores on body parts of the, the beetles and then they'll drill into the vascular tissue of the oaks. And they have different strategies. Some go straight through the tree, some go just around the gallery, like underneath the, um, the different um, living tissue of the tree, right? Because everything on the inside of a tree is dead, but there's layers of living vascular tissue within it. And so a lot of these bark beetles will infect that vascular tissue with the fungus that they eat, or maybe they also supplement their diet with like some of the nutrients that go through the vascular tissue. There's all sorts of different beetles and systems and different fungi. So it's a little hard to answer, but I would say the, the worst of the fungi that are the biggest impact on these drought-stressed oaks, they're going after the vascular 
tissue of these trees. They're going after the phloem and the xylem um, and also the cambium tissue that's creating more xylem, creating more bark, creating more phloem and such. Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, that, that is a, a fascinating area how the, um, the beetles, uh, they, 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 they build their own condos and they bring their own seeds, if you will, for their, 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 uh, their diet uh, and what have you. Okay, uh, here's a question or a comment, an observation from Al. He said, I've observed that a number of redheads seem to be immune to poison oak. So um, I'll have to see. Um, I'll ask um, when I next time I speak with a genetics uh, specialist, I'll ask them if they uh, know anything. I don't know about that. That's hilarious. Um, I'm German Jewish, so I don't know if there's like a Jew thing going on where we're just kind of good at not getting poison oak or something. Um, I've never heard redhead, and plus I'm blonde, so I have red beard, blonde hair really defensive about that. Um, <laughs> um, right. I don't know, that's fascinating. I'm gonna have, my advisor's a redhead and we have like a bunch of redheads in my plant lab, uh, plant ecology lab that I'm in. So I'll have to ask Dr. Polly Schiffman about that. You, really you could do a little, you could do a little survey, get a little quick paper published, you know, <laughs> amongst your botanist friends. All right, but Al did ask a question, which uh, in our native, in our, our uh, area of the of the, the, the city. Uh, this is a raging, raging question. And there's people who are fighting mad about this. Um, are oaks native to the Palos Verdes Peninsula? Were the oaks here 300 years ago, 400 years ago, before the uh, Caucasians came? I, I don't, okay, so I now I'm really curious about that. One of my lab mates does a lot of research with the Palos Verdes blue butterfly. Um, and so I've recently fallen in love with Palos Verdes. Um, did y'all know you have some of the most genetically pure populations of Rus integrifolia? When there's Rus integrifolia in the Santa Monica mountains, I kind of like chuckle to myself. I'm like, oh, it's probably just a hybrid with Rus ovata, but y'all's, Rus integrifolia is it's the real deal. Um, I would be really shocked. I would be super shocked if there weren't Quercus agrifolia in Palos Verdes pre-colonialization, not only because of the indigenous folk that were utilizing acorns, but scrub jays that were going um, across the landscape bringing oaks. And like, that's, too, I've seen scrub jays score, uh, put Rus integrifolia in canary pine uh, palms, canary palms and palos verdes. I would be shocked if they weren't doing kind of similar shenanigans with acorns. Uh, that would really surprise me if y'all didn't have coast live oaks prior to European colonization. Um, Europeans messed up a lot of stuff. And so I, I wouldn't be surprised if that was one of the things they messed yeah, up. Yeah. Well, as I said, it, it, it is a raging debate here amongst uh, us uh, botanists and there's those who believe it and those who don't. And, um, uh, I, I'm skeptical because there are, there is, as far as I know, there, there is actually no evidence, uh, physical evidence of oaks being here that anybody has, that has. If somebody has in the audience some physical evidence or knows of physical evidence um, to, to um, back up Richard's point, I'm not disputing you. I, I, I think what you say makes sense. Um, which is why it's, it's such a fascinating topic. Okay, um, anyway, um, well, since you're in love with Palos Verdes, we hope you'll come and maybe you will find that evidence and put that controversy to rest. All right, um, Dan says, I'm from Rancho Santa Mar Margarita, excuse me, I'm from Rancho Santa Margarita next to MV. I don't know what that is. Is there a way to help out the local oaks besides what you mentioned in, in the discussion and picking up trash? Oh, that's so cool. I really, yeah. So uh, that's Mission Viejo. So they live in South Orange County. Oh, okay. I, I love South Orange County. Um, just I really like, I, I, I get this question from folks and I really think it's important that you work with existing organizations and existing conservation efforts. Um, I know a lot of folks out of UCI are doing cool stuff. Um, I know places like Tree of Life Nursery is like, 
just a beacon of experts that know the goings on of conservation around um, Orange County. Um, there's just like a lot of really great resources out of um, the state and regional parks in the area, like Casper, uh, places around Silverado Canyon. Um, and, oh my gosh, and the Oak Woodlands in Silverado. They're just so pretty. Oh, and I just I just went back to my old neighborhood and I, I went off on a trail and I found Nolina Sis Montana, which just makes my heart sing. It's just such a cool, rare plant. Um, yeah, there's just there's already existing organizations that are doing stuff out there. It's a little higher on the socioeconomic scale. So I wouldn't say trash is the same level that you might find in the San Fernando Valley or in Long Beach. But um, I, I imagine certain neighborhoods kind of get trashed um, as well. But my interest would be stopping development in South Orange County as like the human machine just kind of builds and builds these single family homes that are just consuming South Orange County and destroying oak woodlands and chaparral and coastal sage scrub. I would put my efforts into kind of those places and, um, you know, in, in existing organizations that are stopping development and they're fighting for the, um, you know, fighting for native plants. So that's kind of where I'd put my energies, but looking into protecting spaces and who cares for them and um, what native plant experts say is going on and who they're working with and restoration stuff they're doing. That's kind of where I would go with that. I just want to add one thing to what you said, and that is that um, uh, education, educating people, neighbors, uh, community members, people further away even on the benefits of oak and the beauty of oaks uh, and stuff, people uh, are much more likely to uh, protect what they know and, and what they, they understand. And so I think here in Palos Verdes, um, one of the main functions of our land conservancy is to educate people about the value. So we have an active um, third grade program for, for kids, um, a whole bunch of different education programs. And I think that's an important um, part of helping people to understand uh, you know, and, and ultimately protect things. Okay. Um, what else? Uh, somebody said, um, what about sudden oak tree dieback? I can't believe I didn't mention that. So luckily, Southern California is not impacted by sudden oak phythoptera. Uh, we are super blessed. Uh, phythoptera seems to spread best by water. So areas like Santa Cruz um, are really inundated with sudden oak dieback. So luckily, Santa Monica Mountains, that has not become a problem. Um, that's super bad. And they've also really, there's a really cool research paper that got released recently that showed Phythoptera spreading in Northern California via native plant nurseries. Um, so native plant nurseries would support restoration efforts. And then they'd bring those plants into restoration sites. And then Phythoptera would spread from restoration site to restoration site um, through the plants that were coming from nurseries. So that's why it's so important. Even though we don't have Phythoptera in the San Monica Mountains, that your operation be clean, that your operation be sterile, and that you're not spreading pathogens from your native plant nursery to restoration sites, to, to spaces where native plants are already thriving. Because you could be introducing problems when you're trying to help some a problem. Um, so that's really important that I don't, it, it gets talked about, but I don't think it gets talked about enough of being clean with native plant propagation. Sorry to interrupt you, but um... Uh, Brent sent an email saying that we might have a forced, uh, uh, Zoom might force us off the air. If that if that's the case, thank you very much, Richard. Otherwise, we'll stay on as long as we can um, until everybody's questions are answered. Um, and it looks like uh, I have 916, so we're, we're so far the, the pumpkin hasn't come yet. Anyway, um, all right. Uh, I don't see any more questions in the chat, but does anyone in the audience have any more questions? Well, there was a great comment uh, that I saw earlier about some other bird species that were spreading oak seeds. Mm -hmm. And um, if I scroll back up quite a ways, yeah. That was from Roy. Yeah, it was Roy. Native uh, band-tailed pigeon and yellow-billed magpie, he calls out. Uh, which That's really surprising. 
Wow, that's really cool. I did not know either of those. I Now you've given me something to look into. Uh, <laughs> that is super cool. Uh, love it. Uh, he also notes that there's um, a lot of Coast Live Oaks in the power uh, power pool utility line right of ways. And he put some numbers to that as well. Yeah, that's an interesting correlation. So are you, um, it, was it Roy that made that comment? Roy, maybe you can yeah. make a comment. Hi, yeah. yeah. Or there yeah. are thousands and thousands of oak trees in the LADWP right of ways in Silmar. San Fernando, the North San Fernando Valley. Um, yeah. Go into the backyard. You can't see them from the street, but there's just incredible amounts of oak trees on the private property between different homes where the power lines run. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's the jays. It's the jays that are planting them, and they're re they're sprouting. And so that's one kind of hopeful urban ecology, you know, where our urban residential areas are. Um, are doing that. And there's an area of Culver City where there's hundreds of oak trees germinating. They're not even the native oak. They're the Quercus, um, the one of Europe. Um, Elix? Uh, no. Uh, yeah, yeah, that one. And they're germinating. There was one street called Sunkiss Street that planted a theme, one or two blocks as a theme tree of that European oak. And there are like hundreds of them showing up in everybody's yards. And people don't know they have them growing in their yards. And again, it's an urban scrub jay population that's in Culver City along the Bayona watershed. That's really interesting. Um, compli complicated native bird, non-native oak. Yeah, uh, you know, a lot of um, there's in the Sepulveda Basin has a lot this huge population of non-native uh, ash trees and there's like all these like non-native invasive species in the Sepulveda Basin across from the wildlife preserve. And I noticed a ton of birds in them. That doesn't mean that these, these invasive species are good habitat. That doesn't mean they're ideal habitat. Um, but a lot of these urban population of birds are utilizing them. Um, it's, it, I don't, I, I, it's a complicated situation that, that being black and white about it and being like, this is bad, this is good is, it's not doing the issue justice. It, it, it demands nuance. And I, I'm, I'd be interested in contacting you about the Silmar oak trees. I'd love to go check those out. Um, that's not very far from where I live. So um, I've noticed them. I've always just kind of assumed the oak trees were already there when they developed and that the power line companies kind of preferred that because it was the easiest to develop. But um, that'd be interesting if there was some sort of bird connection there. Oh, yeah, so maybe I'll get in contact with you. Thank you so much. That, that, that'd be cool. Yeah. Okay, well, it's getting kind of late. Um, I think, uh, did, uh, is there a way people could contact you if they have more questions afterwards? Yeah, let me um, throw my email in the chat, but also my Instagram and my iNaturalist handle is a wandering ecologist. And then also this QR code that I put on is for my Instagram. Um, I'm also on Twitter, like not as active, um, but let me throw in my email address. Um, I totally don't mind. Um, I'm not like, I like native plant gardening. I'm not a native plant gardener expert. Um, I like, I, I, I love botany and sometimes I consider myself a botanist, but a lot of times I consider myself a plant ecologist. That nuance might be lost upon a lot of people, but um, I don't know. I can, I'll be honest if I don't know the answer to something. So um, there's so much I don't know. <laughs> okay, well, thank you everybody. Um, don't forget uh, next month we're having our meeting, the first Monday of May. Um, it slips my mind. I know we have a speaker set up, but it slips my mind who it is. So you just have to stay tuned for your email, tune into our website. Um, look forward to uh, next month, you'll be getting a newsletter. And um, we had, at one point I saw 59, I didn't look back at the numbers anymore after that, but um, it's so exciting having Zoom. Uh, I have my issues with Zoom and, and being on the computer so much, but it's just so exciting to be able to see um, people that, that before weren't able to come to our meetings and now are able to come. So 
I really appreciate all of you um, take your time to join us. For those of you who are not members, um, encourage you to become members of CNPS. Um, and uh, if anybody wants to uh, be more active, if somebody has an idea for a field trip, um, you know, I think as people get more vaccinated, um, we'll be able to have field trips again um, and uh, other activities. So um, please, if anyone has any thoughts or ideas on uh, activities we could do, uh, let me know. Um, start taking lots of pictures because we're for sure in December, whether it's in person or on Zoom, uh, we'll be having our uh, photo uh, event. We're hoping to do a program um, in person at Madrona Marsh in July as we have done in the past. If not, it will be virtual. Um, so stay tuned and thank you all again.